YouTube! Welcome to Fred's Full Throttle. In this week's video, here's what I'm going to cover. I'm going to be talking about McMulkin's plans for opening up reservations for the Corvette E-Ray. Yes, you can get one at MSRP. I'm then going to spend most of the time talking about the E-Ray itself and what we've learned about the car. And then I'm going to spend some time talking about my Z06 plan, since I've got an abundance of time to wait. And then finally, I'm going to give you an update on the Lemons team and our progress towards building a race car. I've got a lot to cover, so let's get right into it. First, I want to talk about McMulkin and their Corvette E-Ray process for a moment. It still manages to surprise me that in almost every video where I mention McMulkin, every thread online, there are lots of people who don't believe that they only do MSRP for new Corvettes across all models. It seems that these people either aren't very well informed or are believing what they want to believe. But I figure the more I mention MSRP, the more likely they'll realize that no one's pulling the wool over their eyes, and that if they want a Corvette at MSRP, all they have to do is contact McMulkin. Anyway, on 131, McMulkin will have provided information about how to reserve the car, specifically the amount for the deposit, how to send them a check, right now it sounds like a check is the only form of payment they want to accept, and opening up a line at the dealership. The high-level plan is that at the end of business on 131, they will set up a line at the front of the dealership, and then at 5 a.m. on February 1st, they'll let those people come inside, and then at 8 a.m. they start taking deposits. For those mailing in checks, it sounds like that they will process everyone in line ahead up to the point where the mail arrives, and then all the mail-in letters are going to be taken in the order that they open them. As timing works out, I'm actually filming this before all that happens, so you'll be seeing it a little bit after. Such is how YouTube and schedules work out, and sometimes it can be tricky to report on news stories as they unfold. But if you want an E-Ray, by the time you're seeing this, you still should give McMulkin a call and jump in line. Chances are, for a variety of reasons, the line isn't going to be as long as the Z06 line was, and likely you can cut your weight down significantly just by acting fast. And the car will be at MSRP, no matter how much sputtering and stammering we get from the skeptics. So on to the E-Ray itself. What's all the fuss about, and what exactly is an E-Ray? I think it's worthwhile to detail the car and talk through what it means in the Corvette lineup. First, some quick figures. The car has 655 horsepower and 595 pound-feet of torque from a split powertrain consisting of an LT2 V8 from the Corvette Stingray, mounted amidships, and then an electric motor at the front of the car powering the front wheels. The car is claimed to be the quickest accelerating Corvette to leave the factory, with a 0-60 to 60 time of 2.5 seconds and a quarter mile time of 10.5 seconds. Keep in mind that a $2 million Bugatti Veyron with a W16 engine can only do 2.5 seconds to 60 as well. Now the powertrain itself, as I mentioned, is split. The LT2 gas engine produces 495 horsepower and 470 pound-feet of torque, while the single electric motor at the front of the car produces 160 horsepower and 125 pound-feet of torque. There's a 1.1 kilowatt hour battery in the center chassis tunnel of the car right between the two seats. The astute among you will likely note that 1.1 kilowatt hours is not very big. And this in turn means that the car can only operate in full EV mode, called stealth mode here, for about 5 miles with a max speed of 45 miles per hour. Go further than 5 miles, faster than 45 miles an hour, or really just romp on the loud pedal at all, and that LT2 is going to fire up and the car leaves stealth mode. The interesting implication here is that the electric powertrain here makes it the first all-wheel drive Corvette, as well as stealth mode actually makes it the first front-wheel drive Corvette. As I correctly speculated in my last video on the E-Ray, the car is not an efficiency hybrid. The small battery and the no charging port see to that. You'll likely get slightly better fuel economy than the standard Stingray, but this car is not about saving gas. So what is it? Well, it's a performance hybrid. That means that the powertrain design is here for one thing, to help this car go fast and have monstrous grip. As you'd imagine, adding batteries, computers, and the front electric motor all add weight, about 300 pounds to be specific. This puts the base coupe at 3,966 pounds, and the hardtop convertible crests the two-ton mark at 4,099 pounds. This gives the E-Ray the somewhat dubious distinction of also being the heaviest Corvette ever to leave the factory by quite a margin. However, as you can see from the performance figures, the E-Ray is adding a lot for the cost of that weight. The bodywork here is more or less the same wide body as the Z06, and the chassis is the same wider platform as the Z06 as well. 
The car will accelerate hard all the way to 150, but then at which point the electric motor runs out of gearing and it bows out, and then the car becomes gas only again, all the way up to the top speed of somewhere above 180 miles an hour. The car retains its massive 20 inch 275 section tires in the front and the enormous 21 345s in the rear. Standard tires on the car are the Michelin Pilot Sport all seasons, but Michelin Pilot Sport Pilot 4S's summer tires here are going to be optional. Now hauling the car down from a stop are standard carbon ceramic brakes taken from the Z06 and the car rolls on a unique set of thin five spoke wheels which to me at least evoke an earlier Ferrari like the 458. The base price of the coupe comes in at 104.295 while the hardtop convertible is about $7,000 more at 111.295. So that's the E-Ray in a nutshell. But what's that? There's more to talk about? Why heck yes there is. Now let's talk over a few of the things I've noticed or think stand out about the car. First, a few small notes. There's a low electric hum emitted from the car in stealth mode, sounding every bit as futuristic as you'd expect. This is so you don't mow down pedestrians when you're quietly creeping out of your neighborhood without waking anybody up. In the cabin, there's that hum also heard when you really step on it, though at constant throttle, it seems minimal or non-existent. The front trunk loses less than one cubic foot of space, so the front is near enough identical to the Stingray and the Z06. Gotta love efficient packaging. Jury is out though on how hot it'll get with multiple radiators surrounding it and electric motor just inches away. Should be good for storing takeout food and keeping it warm as you drive home. Modern problems require modern solutions. Now there have been lots of comments on the bodywork colored accents, which visually differentiate the car from the Z06. Some love it, some hate it, and some don't really seem to care. While there is an option to have those accents contrast the car in carbon flash metallic, so everyone can be happy. Several of the press cars at the unveiling had this option, and various YouTubers have already ridden in cars with that differentiated bodywork, so it is available. Now many were speculating that the E-Ray might feature two electric motors in the front. However, it turns out that there's just one. So how does the car send power to each front wheel independently? Well, the car uses an open differential and then uses brake bias torque vectoring. This means that to send power to one side of the car, the brakes on the opposite side are used to drag the brakes a bit and that forces the power to the other front wheel. This also has the added plus of pulling the inside tire into a corner to help the car rotate into a corner. We'll talk about that more in a minute. It's worth noting that in several of the first ride-along videos that were held for the press, the car was repeatedly doing high-speed all-wheel drifts and power slides. The car appeared to be very well balanced and easy to control. I like that Chevy gives you the ability to turn off some of the driver aids and let you play with the car if you find yourself in the right place to do it safely. On to one of the bigger things to talk about here, and that's the standard carbon ceramic brakes. Clearly that's a bit of a unique step for Corvette to include them as a standard option. As some of my longer tenured subscribers or viewers may remember, I did a deep dive video on the carbon ceramic brakes for the Z06 and many, if not all of those points hold true here. I'll link below to that video in case you're curious. Chiefly here though, for the E-Ray, there are likely several reasons that they did decide to make those standard on the car. First is that they're lighter than the iron rotors on the Stingray, and with the car being a bit on the hefty side, every pound really helps. Next, being that the car is heavier, it'll generate significant heat in the brakes when it's slowing down. To provide repeated, solid braking power, it makes sense to go with CCBs, which shed heat much more efficiently and are going to provide a consistent feel after repeated heavy use. This is both a safety and a consistency benefit. The other main feature I see here is that with the brake bias torque vectoring that I mentioned, the brakes here are going to be used somewhat more frequently than on the standard rear wheel drive Corvette. Chances are there's a threshold of acceleration and grip where none of that is used, but if you're doing a really sharp turn under significant power, the car is going to be leaning in on those brakes more than on the standard car. And having fade free consistent performance of CCBs, not to mention the much slower wear and longer life that they come with, this seems like an obvious choice to me. Lastly, in regard to the brakes, keep in mind that these are a $9,000 option on the Z06 and here they're gonna be standard on the E-Ray. Now, while we're on the topic of price, this is one of the areas where I think people were a bit surprised, myself included. Many talked about the car hopefully slotting in in the upper 80K to 90K price range. Keeping in mind that those brakes add about $9,000 to the price of the car, it means that without them, the car theoretically would have cost about 95K which even then is still a bit more than most of us were guessing. Unfortunately, I think the days of a five-figure upper-tier Corvette are over. 
Reception. What Chevy has done here, although I'm sure some of you may disagree, is listen to their customers. They want a jack-of-all-trades car that has blistering performance, relative mechanical simplicity, at a somewhat reasonable price, at least in comparison to its performance rivals. While many initially scoffed at the idea of a hybrid Corvette, I think they aren't actually giving it a fair shake. Think about who the average Corvette owner is and how they use the car. They're likely in their 50s or older, though that's slowly lowering over time. They're going golfing, they're taking weekend drives on back roads, maybe hitting a cars and coffee event or a car show, or taking their significant other out to dinner. They aren't hitting the track, they aren't racing, they aren't putting the handling anywhere near the limits that the car has. But they want the power to stomp on any other car at the stoplight or when overtaking on the highway. And they want it to be reliable and able to be serviced anywhere. That's literally what this car is. Save that Z06 and its harsher ride for those that need it on the track. But my opinion is that this is the better car for most drivers, period. Now diehard enthusiasts are probably going to say that's blasphemy. And others may say that the engine lacks enough character. But neither have ridden in the car or own one. And by all accounts from those that have, they're wrong. I frequently get asked questions like, well, so-and-so said this on their channel. What do you think about that? Or this other channel is saying that the car is terrible. The truth is that many of the channels in the Corvette space lead with sensational thumbnails and titles to get you to click. They don't separate facts and data from speculation, and they purposely pick triggering headlines and sensationalism to get you to click. Recently, there seems to be an influx of this, judging from the number of questions I get, from a subset of channels. This is just my opinion, but honestly, my suggestion is don't watch them. They don't add anything material to the conversation, and they only stir up drama for the purpose of getting money from YouTube, and there's no substance there. I personally trust the engineers at GM infinitely more than someone who aims a camera at themselves and claims that they found issues that GM somehow missed after years of testing, benchmarking, and racing. My advice would be, everything you watch on YouTube, including my own videos, watch with a critical eye and pay attention to if the presenter is calling out opinions as fact or neglecting to tell you the difference. The more clickbaity, more attention-grabbing the headline, the more skeptical you should be. And even when there are issues with a car, Isolated instances don't mean there is a widespread problem. Stay safe, my friends. Now, one last point I'd like to share about the E-Ray is about the Corvette lineup. Seems to me there's roughly a $40,000 gap between a base Stingray and the next cheapest car, the E-Ray. With the LT2 from the Stingray and with the wide body and all the running gear from the Z06, it seems to me that for about 25 k more than the Stingray, you could build a pretty compelling Grand Sport for about 89500 Still a solid 15k less than the E-Ray, but offering most of the looks and the performance. It'll be interesting to see what GM does next. Alright, so up next I wanted to talk a bit about my Z06 and my current plans or thoughts. Many of you know that I'm in the low 1100s now at McMulkin, having dropped about 70 spots since I initially put my reservation in a year and a quarter ago. Still, I'm saving up money and I'm not really exactly sure what I want to do. However, I have a few thoughts that have been gaining steam in my head. One thing that I've decided is I want to keep the C7. It's a manual, I love it, and I think it's the best looking Corvette ever made. Every time I drive it, I have fun, and I always think to myself, this is such a great car. I don't care that it's not as fast as the C8 Stingray, much less the Z06. Losing the manual for the Z06 is what scares me, because I care about engagement more than the outright speed, and the GS is still more car than at least I can currently reach the limits of. Now another idea that's been mulling around in my head is that for the money I've saved for the Z06, it's enough to build my planned two-stall garage and build some sort of fun project car, whether a Porsche, Cobra, or something else. I could build a dedicated space to film my videos, have one or two lifts, and buy more cars over time. I'm not necessarily convinced that I'd have more fun with one car than instead having two or three cars and a garage. Now I'm still saving up and I don't have to make any choices anytime soon, but that's currently what's in my head. Fun as the Z06 is, I think that my biggest hurdle would be losing that manual. Now what would you do in my shoes? Leave your thoughts in the comments, I'm interested to hear. And as my thoughts change over time, or don't, I'm gonna be sure to share that. Now you may have noticed something different in this video. I wanna take a moment to give a quick shout out to Zanvis Neon. 
You may have noticed that fancy new sign behind me. I paid for it myself without any discount, but I wanted to call out how good the quality is and that I'm absolutely thrilled with it. I worked with one of their designers to get my logo translated into an LED neon and it shipped quickly. From inception to having it here at my house was less than two weeks. It was very well packaged and I couldn't be happier. They also gave me the lowest quote out of three different LED neon shops I reached out to, as well as the best design product. Special thanks to Tony for his help throughout the process and answering all my questions and requests. If you're interested in a cool neon sign, I suggest checking them out and I'll link their website in the description. Again, I don't get anything from saying this. I'm sharing it purely because I'm very happy with my sign. Thank you, Zanvis, and thank you, Tony. All right, on to lemons. Before I close, here are a few quick updates on the 24 hours of lemons front. Things are moving along pretty quickly. Last week, we all met up at the garage and dropped off all of our gear for starting to work on the car. Tools, a welding setup, a giant machine table, and a bunch of other stuff were dropped off. We also put up some of the shelving and cleaned up the space pretty well. This past Friday, we visited HMS Motorsports in Danvers, Massachusetts, and picked out a racing seat, a harness, and some of the other safety-related components. I bought my racing suit, which is an Alpine Stars, as well as the shoes and some other bits and bobs. Next is going to be the gloves, the socks, and a few other pieces of equipment. It's an amazing store, full of all kinds of safety gear, which turns out that's all they sell. We tried out a bunch of seats and suits and figured out what works best. Now we're in the process of tracking down roll cage builders and to get on somebody's schedule. We should hopefully have that lined up soon. And, fingers crossed, we should be picking up our car this coming Saturday. We've got a trailer lined up and we should be good to go. As I have more info here, I'll definitely be sharing. So thank you for watching. I hope you enjoyed this and until next time, Fred out!